questions in the form of a question. Keep it short uh, so that uh, we can process as many questions as possible in the time we have allotted. Uh, one very significant strain of uh, humorous or funny song uh, is the parody. Um, or, uh, for example, very much like uh, Weird Al, where he will take an existing song and put new lyrics on it. Or uh, somebody does one uh, in the style of, of somebody else. And one of the things that I remember uh, specifically is the Paul and Storm and Jonathan uh, did this contest. They were in a contest where they had to write in each other's styles. Um, and uh, Paul and Storm named the song that uh, you guys did, the title of that and the basic idea of it. We wrote a song called Live. And um, the concept was it was a a Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein character who had given up on finding a girlfriend and decided to build his own. <laughs> by the way, he was sad. He was sad. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Jonathan Colton, name the song that tells us. My song was called Big Dick Farts a Polka. <laughs> measures, as in votes that actually counted in the contest, Jonathan won, <laughs> but in reality, we were the ones that ended up with the song we were proud to sing in our song. <laughs> I will tell you, I will tell you, the order, the order in which I conceived of this song. The title came first. <laughs> and then it suggested a, suggested a story. It's a guy, a guy named Richard, who's maybe fat, who can fart in a way that plays polka. Obviously, lives in Pennsylvania. It's, it sort of unspools from there, it writes itself. The second, the second thing that occurred to me was the ending, which is da 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 <laughs> We didn't start from the ending. Yeah. <laughs> Most of our songs end with the, a tag and a fart sound, so... <laughs> That's what I was thinking. It's implied, anyway. But I, I, just speaking, speaking for myself, uh, you know, uh, listening, listening to your parody of me uh, made my blood run cold. <laughs> I, felt, I felt pretty thoroughly skewered, so... Uh, Kudos, kudos to you. Like, you like the Goddamn, the bridge. <laughs> like, you sort of wander around. The bridge for a just modulates to this other chord and then it sort of wanders. <laughs> kind of comes in for a landing and then it's like, whoa! <laughs> when we toured together for a great number of years, Jonathan and us, he would often describe the bridges of his songs in that manner that my bridges. Whoa! <laughs> whoa! whoa! Okay, right, good. <laughs> I had a question, but now I don't even know what it is. <laughs> we didn't really write it as a joke, though. It really was, you know, what decision would Jonathan make here? So we really were trying to construct a Jonathan Colton song. <laughs> right. right. So actually, that does bring back to the question very quickly, so that we can open up the questions. Is, so when you are doing the parody, or when you are trying to write in the style of another writer for comedic effect, is it harder to do because you are working with something that already exist rather than doing your original thing. I don't know if it's harder, it's sort of a slightly different skill set. Um, you know, it's, it's, you're sort of doing an imitation, and as Storm said, you're trying to sort of put yourself in, you know, figure out how, how they approach, how would they approach this thing. Uh, what that song actually, I think it came pretty easily to us. You found the sort of the guitar riff and the feel of it. Well, and the theme. And the like theme. Like it was, what hasn't Jonathan done yet? You yeah. Know, he's done. He's done squids, he's done what zombies, so what's left? Frankenstein. Yes. Um, I don't know if it was necessarily harder, but it, can, it certainly can be. But it is definitely a slightly different skill set than just write a funny song. Yeah. Molly, even anything to add either? Well, for me, I had to do a lot of those kind of parodies. And um, the most time consuming aspect for me is just you have to back engineer whatever you're doing. Because in my case, it's usually they never want, it's never the Weird Al thing. Weird Al actually pays, yeah. he does the right thing gets the song, changes the lyrics, and, and the original songwriters make some money off it. Um, in TV, they don't do that. They're like, can you write a song? This Here's the parody concept. And so you have to, I try to make, I, I'm very conservative about that. I don't want to, you know, I want to make it like it's another song off that album. So it's musically, compositionally very different, but it's got to sound like it. So if it's an album that was recorded in the 60s, you want it to sound like that era. And so 
lacking the time consuming, really. but I think the joke isn't as funny unless it's really uh, authentic sounding. So you spend hours trying to either you know, find the sounds, make the sounds, figure it out, and back engineer how do they do, you know, what, what was their recording? So. Molly, anything else? Nope. Okay. I actually, I actually find it a little easier to do a style parody or a straight parody because you know that your listener already knows so much. Right. So it's sort of a lot of the work is already done. But then that means the rest of the work that you do from there has to be exceptionally good. And that's, I think, the genius of Weird Al is that he is exceptionally good. Even though you know the song, he's adding a lot of uh, new, unique things to it. Okay, so now we are going to go for questions for the audience, and uh, we'll start over here. Go ahead. Hi there, guys. Um, I had a, uh, probably a question you guys have answered a lot before, so I apologize if that's the case. Um, but I'm kind of curious, since a lot of you have created a lot of content, uh, I'm curious uh, what song you had the most, or rather the audience had the most surprising reaction to. So like, what song you put out there and got you the most kind of unexpected reaction? And uh, what that was, or why it was unexpected to you? That's a great question. Um, I think we're going to go with the song from our first band, Da Vinci's Notebook, where uh, it's a, a hit of ours that really kind of, kind of kept us going into where we are. If you trace long, long line long enough, I'm delaying actually saying the name of the song. It's called Enormous Penis. <laughs> which is something that, that Paul had written as just this funny little thing. Right when you know. <laughs> and we knew it was funny. At the time, we didn't have, like, you know, a huge, massive following. And it was our manager who convinced us to send it to radio stations randomly. And... <laughs> Wait, what was not, not, like, just, like, just drop it there. Like, you know, like a song. There are methods for doing this that are known. It is known. And... We were very surprised that this one radio show picked it up and that so many people would connect to it. And it was early internet age, so we were suddenly getting emails from places we had never been or thought to go. Uh, you know, Upper Michigan. And uh, that Middle was it, right? Yeah. That's it, just Upper Michigan. <laughs> but that, um, yeah. That's, yeah, it was just it was surprising how that song became kind of embraced and became you know what we were not we were not expecting that to be our hit. So. <laughs> uh, I the for me the I, one of my favorite songs to play for audiences is I Crush Everything the song about the sad giant squid. Uh, thank you. Uh, because I can tell how many people have heard it before. It's fascinating because if it's a new audience they will laugh at the lines that, you know, I hate my beak and, and the dolphins are all phonies. Uh, if it's an audience that has heard the song a few times, it's pin drop quiet. And it's the craziest thing because it is, it is a song that the first time you hear it, you're like, oh, that's hilarious. And the tenth time you hear it is you're like, oh God, it's me! That's <laughs> great! It's really very powerful, so I, I, love to, I love to throw that song in front of a new audience who's never heard it before and say, this is about a giant squid who hates himself, ha ha ha. And then I sing it and they're laughing and they're laughing and the laughter dies eventually over the course of the song until the end they're all, they're all weeping and silent. I love, it's like punching the audience in the face. No offense. Uh, oh, surprising songs. Probably the MySpace song, the first one that I wrote, because, like I said, it was a terrible slam poem. And I went, well, I have this lyricless song sitting around, what if I put these two together? And I stuck it on the internet, and then Dig found out and was like, hey, everybody, let's all watch this song at once and freak out this high schooler, apparently. <laughs> and before then, I, I just I didn't think there was even an audience for that sort of thing. I didn't know why I would bother to write songs, but I had this terrible slam poem that wasn't going to get used, so I might as well. And then... <laughs> Half a million YouTube views later, I was like, maybe I should write a second song. <laughs> Welcome to your career. Okay. Thank you. I think the one that most surprised me was a teeny little cue I did for Mr. Show. It was one of like a bunch I had to write in one night, and it was um, a parody of. They just said we need some music in the background that teenagers would be listening to, and, okay. and at the time. Uh, that song, Barbie Girl, or I'm a Barbie Girl. <laughs> so it was a song like that called, I'm a Party Girl. And it's my voice 
uh, pitch shifted up, just, I'm a party girl, kind of thing. And apparently that ended up on the internet with a bunch of different animations. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. So that was fun. All right, uh, other questions? Anyone else? Uh, way in the back, yell it. I can yell it, that's okay. Yeah! <laughs> Ooh. Mm. Ah. Some easiest. We're going to start on this end yeah. first, yeah, because you always get to start. <laughs> well, arduous, um, and, and it was terrible. Uh, I did a song that was for the movie Dumb and Dumberer with Harry McLoy. A classic. Which, <laughs> the whole experience was something else. Um, uh, I did the score for that, and then there was this song, and it was one of those ones where from the beginning they go, we want you to do this song and they, they knew what they wanted it to be about. It was basically exactly what they'd already done on South Park with Chef a bunch of times. It's like, okay. So um, I think I did almost 19 versions of it. And it was one of these things where uh, the very first version I did, uh, the director took it and uh, played it, laughed at this couple places and, hey, you listen to this. And they laughed at a couple places. So the first round of notes, and they were all in the same places. Those places are two on the notes. Take those out, <laughs> change it, next. and then it changed and changed, and notes and changed, and that was just a complete nightmare. Um, and then we thought we got it okay, where uh, me and a choreographer that was working on it, we worked together where certain moves would happen with certain lyrics, so it was a combination of what was happening on screen with the lyrics would be the joke. And then at the last one, they went, oh, we're not going to do any of that stuff now. We're just going to have them go down the hallway and sing it. Oh, hey, so then there's no jokes. And uh, then it got, then when they broke the news to me that it got cut from the movie, it was like I had to fake having anything <laughs> out of the hall. It was like, it's, yes, my God, that would have been the end of me. Um, so that was our uh, The easiest was probably that La 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 Vida song. <laughs> As it would be. Yes, of course. Just kidding. Look on the internet for how many terms there are for vagina. There's my verses. Done. <laughs> Molly. I respect that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably the, the easiest song that I've written was also very labial in its theme because um, Cards Against Humanity asked me to write a song about literally anything in this deck of theirs for their Christmas pack. Huh? And one of them was the Hawaiian goddess Capo. <laughs> Um, who has a flying detachable vagina, and I was like, that, that's on brand, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like short, and everybody got paid for it, so does it have verses? I don't know, does it have a bridge? Who cares? It all just came out at once. Um, I think the hardest, the most arduous one was a song that I wrote for uh, this, uh, Thanksgiving versus Christmas, which is a musical that I wrote with Josh. Josh, what, Josh, wait, wait, hey, hi, Josh. Um, I wrote a song for my, my friend Nicole Deeker, who is a friend of the boat, um, and I tried to write, I, I, was, I was trying to write basically not getting married today from company, but about Christmas, and so it's got like five A rhymes in every paragraph, and it was the last song I finished like a couple weeks away from the show, and I don't know why I did that to myself, but I'm really proud of it, and you should all get Thanksgiving versus Christmas and listen to it, so I didn't have to write that song for nothing. <laughs> Uh, I think they all feel arduous when I'm working on them, and the more uh, separation I have from them in time, the easier I remember them being. Uh, so it's hard to say, but the the I feel like one of the really easy ones was the Portal song, which, uh, for whatever reason, the character of GLaDOS was just so clear to me. I just knew exactly who she was. I felt like I could channel her voice so easily, maybe because she and I share the same penchant for annoying passive-aggressive behavior. <laughs> uh, but that one, you know, once I, had, once I had kind of talked to the writers and once I had played the game and heard her talk through the game, it was, it was very, it just came right out. It was very easy. Um, the <laughs> In reference to the way I started this answer, I will say the most arduous song was the last song I wrote for my uh, new album, because it was the last one I had to write for the album. And I didn't think I could do it, and it took a long time, because I had a lot of blockage about it, but it's done! Uh, uh, our worst, our, not necessarily the most arduous, but it took the longest uh, in recent memory was the Irish sing-along song. 
because it didn't start out. It originally started out, we had the idea of, uh, can we write like a pre-forgotten sing-along song? A dude was stoned and remembers this song that was awesome and everybody sang along but couldn't remember what, it, what the words were. And we took a few different swings at that over the course of probably about two years and put it away a while and, and tried again and put it away and finally, uh, eventually hit on the, the Irish sing-along aspect of it and that, it felt like it had enough meat on the bones finally to finish it. Yeah, it's actually rare for us to work arduously on the thing because we'll <laughs> no, no, really, because if if we'll usually truncate it, um, if there's only that much humor there, we'll go with that because there's a term in comedy that you're doing something, you're sweaty, you can you can hear the writer in it, where oh, I have to have a third verse, and that third verse is gonna be terrible, um, so. That's why, and this was a rare case where we loved the idea so much, but we just hadn't found the right hook for it. And when we did, then you know, then it was easy. Um, I think the easiest thing, and it happens for us a lot, where we're just so giddy and happy and excited, and it just spills out. But like the short songs, the commercials, the one sentence. Uh, if James Taylor were on fire. <laughs> uh, all right, and that's all the time that we have. Sorry, everybody, no more questions. But uh, I want to thank. All of the folks up on the panel. Storm, Paul, Jonathan, Molly, and everything you want to come in. Uh, remember here, you are going to teach Amy Long how to be a nerd.